Okay, in this video, we're going to cover the kingdom Protista, found in the domain Eukarya. Under the domain Eukarya, there's four kingdoms, and we need to know all of these. Those are kingdom Protista, kingdom Fungi, kingdom Plantae, and kingdom Animalia. The reason I put a star next to kingdom Animalia is because it's so information dense. All these other kingdoms can be covered in like one or two videos. Animalia is going to take a couple videos to cover all that information. The first kingdom we're going to look at is protista. So remember, these are eukaryotic organisms. Most protists are unicellular, so that means they're just a single-celled organism. But you also have some that are multicellular. So you have both uni- and multicellular organisms found within this kingdom. There are also autotrophic protists and heterotrophic protists. So autotrophic protists are going to make their own organic molecules for energy. Heterotrophic protists are going to rely on the consumption of autotrophs or the products that they make for energy. Many protists found in nature express a symbiotic relationship with another life form. So like a parasitic protist is going to live within a host and rely on that host for energy. But we also have free living protists that do not express a symbiotic relationship with another type of organism. Then here's one main characteristic of protists. They're all found in moist environments. And we're going to look at three protists that we need to know for the DAT. And those are plant-like protists, animal-like protists, and fungus-like protists. In the first video, I mentioned the importance of mapping out taxonomic groups. So here's an example of how I would map out something like this, where you have the domain eukarya at the top, then you have the various kingdoms underneath it. So here we have the kingdom protus. And then off to the side, you want to know, okay, what is a protus? What makes it unique from the other kingdoms here? Then underneath protus, we have the three types that I just mentioned that we want to look at. Then for each type, I want to say, okay, what makes a fungus-like protus an actual fungus-like protus compared to an animal-like protus? And what are some key examples that I should know for the DAT? So this is just an example of how you should map out or can map out taxonomic groups. Okay, let's look at the first type of protist, and that's a plant-like protist. So what makes it plant-like? Well, it's like a plant because it's photosynthetic. It's an autotroph. It produces its own energy. Of course, these protists are found in aquatic, moist environments. Because plant-like protists are photosynthetic, they have chloroplasts, which can undergo photosynthesis. Even though they undergo photosynthesis, they're not considered plants. They're plant-like. They differ from plants because they do not have that vascular system like leaves and roots and stems. Plant-like protists are key in uh, the ecosystem. They're critical primary producers in the food webs. They're found on the bottom of the food chain. So you're going to have heterotrophic microbes and other protists and animals that are consuming these protists, and that's where you're getting that biomagnification of energy in the food chain and in the overall ecosystem. A common example of a plant-like protus is a dinoflagellate. So these commonly show up on the DAT. They're unicellular plant-like protus. So they have two flagella. That's what gives them that di, meaning two, dinoflagellate. That's their name. They cause red tide. Over here is a picture of red tide. Remember, these are found in aquatic environments. Red tide is just the common name for an algal bloom. That's where you have an influx of nutrients in the aquatic environment, usually from the seafloor. These nutrients are going to increase the rate of reproduction of dinoflagellates by a massive amount. And this is detrimental because dinoflagellates are toxic. They release harmful toxins in the environment, so it kills off all the other species in the aquatic environment. So overall, it's detrimental for an ecosystem. One thing that's unique about dinoflagellates is the fact that they're considered both heterotrophic and autotrophic. Autotrophic makes sense because they're a plant-like protist. They can produce their own energy through photosynthesis. But they're heterotrophic because um, they're considered a parasite where they live inside of another organism, and that's another way that they can obtain energy. A key example of a plant-like protist is going to be a euglenoid. Euglenoids are considered flagellates. A flagellate describes a group of organisms that have flagella uh, used for movement. Now, euglenoids are unicellular, that means one cell is that organism, and they're plant-like protists that clump together, so they live in packs. Now, this group of organisms express a wide variety of obtaining energy. You have some that are autotrophic, photosynthetic organisms that are uh, making their own organic molecules for energy. You also have heterotrophic euglenoids that use phagocytosis, which is the ingestion of extracellular material, whether it's cells or just molecules for energy. You're also going to have diffusion, which is the movement of particles across the cellular membrane. 
And euglenoids are plant-like protists. They're protists. So remember, they have those key characteristics of a protist, like living in a moist environment. So these guys here live in fresh water environments. Lastly, the most unique morphological feature of a euglenoid is going to be the pellicle. The pellicle is a structure underneath the actual cell membrane, and it's comprised of protein strips. These protein strips can be very rigid or flexible, but it gives the cell its morphological shape. And when looking at euglenoids underneath a microscope, you can see striations, and that is the pellicle. So in this picture right here, we have these long lines. These are those protein strips. All these protein strips together comprise the pellicle. So remember, again, this is underneath the cellular membrane. Another example of a plant-like protist is going to be a diatom. So diatoms are a type of algae. Now we're going to look at what algae is in a second on the next slide, but diatoms are single-celled, so that means unicellular plant-like protists. Um, because they're a plant-like protist, they're photosynthetic. And they clump up together and they live in packs. And they're found in both fresh and marine environments. But remember, they're found in aquatic environments because they're a protist. They're classified based on their shape. So here we have a centric diatom, and then off on the right-hand side, we have a pennate diatom. Here's a clump of them together. Before we move on, let's look at what algae is. And to simply put it, it's an informal taxonomic grouping. Here on the left, we have what pops up when you Google what is algae. And it says algae contain chlorophyll, but they lack true stems, roots, and leaves, and vascular tissue of, of a plant. So it's considered algae. If you look on Wikipedia, they say it's an informal term for a large diverse group of photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms that are not necessarily closely related. If you see or hear the term algae, simply put, this is what you need to know. Number one, it's an informal taxonomic group. There is no kingdom or phylum or class of algae. It's informal, so this does not fall within the Linnaean uh, taxonomic divisions. Two, all algae is going to be found in aquatic environments, so moist environments here. Three, it can be uni or multicellular. So unicellular, like cyanobacteria, which is sometimes referred to as blue-green algae, is a prokaryotic cell, so that's a single-celled organism. It's unicellular, whereas multicellular algae also exists, and that's in a completely different domain. That's in eukarya. These, those are eukaryotic cells and not prokaryotic cells. Here's the main thing, though. Algae is always going to be photosynthetic because it has photosynthetic pigments, and it's never going to have complex tissues like um, plants like leaves, roots, and stems. Okay, just a side note, I thought I'd include this just in case. If you ever encounter brown algae, this is not in the kingdom protista. This is just a common type of algae. So it's all macroscopic, it's all multicellular. Key example would be like seaweed and kelp. We have two common phyla of algae that are plant-like protists. So here we are in the domain Eukarya, the kingdom is Protista, and now we are in phylum. The first phylum is Chlorophyta, which is sometimes referred to as the phylum of green algae. So remember, this algae found in this phylum is going to be a plant-like protist, and it can either be a uni or a multicellular type of algae here. The other phylum is Rhodophrida, and this is the phylum that people like to call the red algae. So this is all going to be multicellular algae that has red pigments to it, hence the name. And one unique thing about red algae is they do not have flagella. Let's move on to the second group of protists, and that's a fungus-like protist. Now, if you ever hear or see the word slime molds or water molds, it's referring to a fungus-like protist. Don't confuse it with fungus, though, because fungus is unique in the fact that it has chitin, uh, found within its cell walls. Fungus-like protists do not have chitin. But one thing that they do share in common with fungi is that they reproduce by spores. And we're going to look at what spores are, sporulation, when we look at the kingdom of fungi. Another thing that they share in common with fungi is that they're all considered heterotrophic. So these are decomposers, those saprobes, the saprophytes that live off of dead, decaying organic matter. Okay, let's look at our third type of protist, and that's an animal-like protist. This specific group is often referred to as protozoans or protozoa, so whenever you hear those two words, it's the exact same. They're just talking about animal-like protists here. Now, they're called animal-like protists because they have key features of an animal, like being heterotrophic, so you have no autotrophs here, and being very mobile. They move around with either cilia or flagella. 
All animal-like protists are single-celled. They're unicellular organisms. These unicellular organisms ingest their food by a process known as phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is just like endocytosis, where a cell is going to use its plasma membrane to engulf external matter, like algae, fungi, bacteria, organic molecules. It's going to use its cell membrane to ingest that and then digest that for energy. Here's a few key species of protozoans, or animal-like protists, that may pop up on your DAT. The first is forams. These produce something called a test, which is an outer shell. And they're found on the sea bottom. Uh, another word for the bottom of the ocean is benthic. Organisms that live in a benthic environment are referred to as benthos, or they live near the surface, which makes them platonic. The second type of animal-like protist is a paramecium. What you should know about these little guys is that they use cilia, hair-like projections, to move around. That's different from the third type, which is an amoeba, an amoeboid. These guys move by utilizing their cytoplasm, so they extend their cytoplasm, like this guy here, to kind of crawl around in their external environment. The last type you should know is an apicomplexin. Simply put, these are always going to be inside of an animal. So they are parasites of animals. That host is always going to be an animal. And here's just a random fact about an everyday animal-like protist is a plasmodium. That's an animal-like protist that causes malaria. So that's it for kingdom protista. Let's move on to fungi. So kingdom fungi, the second kingdom in eukarya.